Well, I would like you to look at um, 2 Samuel here in chapter 20. Any of you ever have mama put you to bed with the story of uh, the Sheba Rebellion? Little 12-year-old boys love this in Sunday school because you see a beheading and a disemboweling. And there's nothing that is a greater Bible story to a young boy than those things. I asked one time a friend of mine, an exterminator, I said, what is it that is the worst thing you can have in a house to do extermination on? He said, skunk. He said, whenever you have a skunk that gets into the attic or gets, what's worse, into the wall and dies, he said, termites don't stink. Dead skunks are a problem. And he said, uh, they will not stay confined. They will touch every area of your house. And so I'm going to show you here about how God deals with a dead skunk. That there is to be nothing in our lives that stands in opposition to the revealed word of God, either in truth or in morality, that we are to be totally consecrated. And what God does with a person's city, what he can do with a nation who lifts up their hand against God's anointed. Can humans ever do that? Stiffen their neck. Like Charles read to you, he that receives the son receives the father and he who renounces him, the wrath of God abides. To renounce the person, the word, the work, the life of Christ is not to reject an alternative idea. God in that sense is not narrow-minded. To reject the person of Christ is to reject the tip of the iceberg of eternity. Christ is the image of God made visible, the word of God made audible. He is God come down to us. To refuse him refuses the totality of the infinite personal holy God. And it becomes injurious to God and it becomes dangerous to everybody around. And God has to deal with it. In Ananias and Sapphira, in Achan in the Old Testament, he deals with it in a rebellion of a man named Sheba. So it's quite a story. Joab is about to put his fourth notch on his sword. Abner, Uriah he was complicit with, Absalom, Amasa. Joab is about to put his fourth man to death. Let's watch how this happens here. The Sheba rebellion took place in verse 1 through verse 3 of chapter 20. A Benjamite raised up named Sheba, and he led a revolt of the ten tribes against Judah and the tribe of Simeon that is within Judah, like a, almost like a child in, in the fetal sack that he is within Judah. And so Sheba leads a coup. Now there's three things you don't do in the nation of Israel. You don't murder because if you murder, there is no sanctuary. Even if you flee to the temple of God, they will take you off from the horns of the altar. So there's no sanctuary. Uh, idols, any person, any family, or any city that embraced an idol was regarded as a skunk in the wall. And that city came down. That city came down and could not be rebuilt. That man died and there was stones raised over him in the renunciation of God to the worship of the creation. You didn't do it. And another thing was a coup. God could set down a Saul and raise up a David, but you could not. There could be no revolt in Israel against the powers that be. This is carried over into the Christian life. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Whenever that authority crosses God, then you've got to stand. But other than that, uh, God was the one that would depose. Well, Sheba has led a rebellion. And there's going to be a, a, a city 
called Beth Mekah that is going to inadvertently receive this rebel. And we will see what God does against the person and against the city that lifts their hands against the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed. It's not pretty. In verse 4, David says to Amasa, Amasa is David's uh, nephew. He is cousin to Joab. This is a family deal here. Well, David says to Amasa that he had put in the place of Joab as a punishment for killing Absalom. He said, call out the men uh, of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. And so this new commander is about to get his baptism by fire, a mesa. And in verse 5, Judah was slow to volunteer to go after the uh, Sheba and the possibility of, a, of an 80-20 mismatch of 10 northern tribes against two southern tribes. And so in verse Five, Amasa went to call the men of Judah, but he delayed more than the time which he had appointed him. David said in verse four, three days. When does Barney Five say nip it? In the bud. You've got to get it quickly. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. This was about to be a Hatfield McCoy deal. This wasn't going to be two entities. Absalom versus David. This is north versus south. This is getting racial in a sense. This is about to get ugly. And so David says in verse 6, he's going to do us more harm than Absalom ever thought about doing. So you got 72 hours. Let's go find this guy before he gets himself holed up in a city and we can't find him. Well, Amasa delays longer. Apparently Judah was slow to volunteer. Many are they who boast of their kinship to the king that are slow with their service. Can that ever be true with Christians? Many can talk about the nearness they have to Christ until it's time to step up and they didn't show up. Men love a cheap loyalty, always have. Back in the Revolutionary War, a fellow named Mr. Thomas Paine, y'all may remember, put out a publication called the Sunshine Patriot. You just can't be an American when it's fun. When push comes to shove, you've got to be there. And so it is with Christ, and so it is with David. So the men of Judah boasted on their nearness to their king, but they're not really sure they want to put their necks at risk for him. Well, in verse 6, so David says to Abishai, that is Joab's little brother, David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him so that he does not find for himself fortified cities and escape from our sight. And then this thing metastasize. Then he will become carcinogenic and start bringing in more and more. And we've got this problem. Uh, I want to show you an interesting point here. Even though Amasa does not show up because he can't get the men apparently, David doesn't go to Joab. He goes to Joab's little brother. Uh, Joab is for the second time passed over. Now there's something interesting here. Whenever Joab murdered Abner way back earlier, it didn't move David to set him down. Joab was disloyal to David, but that disloyalty was to Abner. It was impersonal to David. So he let it slide. When he executed Absalom, that was an act of loyalty to Israel because David was about to let this guy go free. And the return of all of Israel depended on the head dying. And so his execution of Absalom did move David to fire him. He was, because the killing of Absalom was an act that was loyal but it was personal to David. David didn't keep shop on strict rules. He acted when it got close to home. 
it was a fellow named, an Anglican bishop named Bishop Hall that said, Joab smarteth for a loyal obedience. He was loyal in putting down Absalom unlike David would do. And he smarteth, he stung because of a loyal obedience where he didn't because of a disloyal act in the killing of Abner. And uh, Matthew Henry said that slippery are the stations of earthly honors. Do humans always recompense you with the honor that you deserve? They don't. Can humans ever disappoint you? As long as you trust in human beings, even a King David, to always treat you as you judicially feel as a right recompense. Slippery are the slopes of earthly honors. Happy are those, he said, who are in the favor of him in whom there is no shadow of turning. God will never do us wrong, but humans can. I'm even told that husbands can sometimes be unjudicial. I just heard of it. In verse 7, and so Joab's men went out after him along with the Carathites and the Pelethites. Joab still is going to accompany uh, Abishai. Do you think it is because he is loyal or do you think it is because he is looking for an opportunity? It is the latter. And so he takes the, those uh, Carathites and Pelethites are Philistines that had left the Philistine area and been loyal to David. Little interesting side note. A Carathite was a, they're like the seals of the Philistines. They were the loyal soldiers. They're called Carathites because the, the Philistines came from the Isle of Crete. They were sea peoples. And thus Crete, Carath, is the same word. And they came from Crete and they found themselves loyal to David. What's interesting is in the New Testament, as the apostles are dying and the New Testament age is coming to an end, the apostle Paul appoints two of his guys and their job is to take over his biggest churches. One is called Ephesus that Timothy takes over in First and Second Timothy. And the other is Titus. And Titus takes over. Do you all remember from the book of Titus what church that Titus takes over? For this reason, I left you behind in Crete. It's interesting that the Carathites get their own church. That's just a, you know, just if you feel appreciative, give next week to the Hefo. All right. And so in verse 7, and so they went on from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bikri. And in verse 8, the two forces meet, those of Amasa and those of Abishai. At the large stone in Gibeon, and Amasa came to meet him, to his cousin, to welcome him into the, the soldiery of Judea. And Joab is dressed in his military attire. And over it was a belt with a sword and the sheets fastened at his waist. And he went forward and it fell out. Now think about that. A professional soldier who has never lost a battle, Joab, he just happens to drop his weapon. Does that sound normal? Well, it's odd to have the top guy, all of a sudden drop his weapon. And so he conveniently picks it up with his hand. He, in verse 7, walks forward amicably. He says, is it well, amicable, amicable words, my brother, because it's his cousin, takes him by the beard of the right hand, with the right hand to kiss him. Everything looks good in what he says, how he approaches, how he touches him. But his words are drawn swords, it says in the Psalms. And in verse 10, Amasa was not on guard because this was his cousin that was in Joab's hand. He struck him in the belly, poured out his inward parts. He disemboweled him and he didn't strike him again. What that means is that there was not a fight put up because he was completely unbeknownst. He is unguarded and it is sunk within him. And Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, son of Zikri. Joab now conveniently steps in the vacated position. 
And in verse 11, he has it planned that one of Joab's young men says, whoever is for Joab and for David, let him follow him. And now he has usurped Abishai. And so Joab is expertise in assassination and in military takeover. In verse 12, Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. The man saw that the people stood still. Why did the people stay still? Because, as one fellow said, how well can a murderer pursue a traitor? They're not sure they want to go after Joab. Abishai is loyal to David. Joab, I'm not sure. And so they look at the horror. This is a murder. This is not war. This is murder. Joab had taken, I'm sorry, Abner had taken the life of Joab's brother, Asahel, in battle. And so he assassinated him. This is not any sort of vengeance. You're just a man who took my position. And so his soldiers are not sure. Because you never want to be close on the heels of a man who is in rabid opposition unto God. And so they pause. And what does Joab do? In verse 12, or in 13, it says... Uh, he is removed from the highway. Verse 12, they throw a garment over him. They just cover it and go on. Do y'all remember a case in the Old Testament of fratricide where a fellow killed his brother and then God confronted him? Where is thy brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And he buried his dead body and covered it and God knew where it was. Who was the killer? Cain slew Abel. And so we have the same thing of men covering up blood and then pursuing their ambitions. God will deal with Joab. When he is an old man in the reign of Solomon, he will be drugged from the temple complex and he'll be put to death. And so in verse 12, or verse 13, we continued, and as soon as he is removed from the highway, the men passed on after Joab to pursue Sheba. You know, there's a point that's interesting right here. And when I was a young fellow in the ministry, I read Mr. Charles Spurgeon speak about it. He said, David has one thing in his life that he cannot control, that everything is under control except Joab who murders Abner, who murders, who kills his son, who murders Amasa. And he finds himself complicit with him in Uriah's death and it comes back to haunt him. And his, his son Solomon has to deal with this, this collateral damage in his life. And Spurgeon talked about how no matter who the man or the woman is, God providentially will put something in your life that you can't control. No matter if you're David. And you would like to control it. Do we tend to be that way? We make good saved people, but we make for bad deities. You know what I'm saying? Of wanting to control. And so God always puts something there to where we say like David, the sons of Abishai are, are, of Benai are too difficult for me. Just too difficult. My wife has the gift of administration. Our marriage gets along because I don't mess with her life and I don't mess with mine. And we do well. But even she realizes there's some things. Maybe it's another person. Maybe it's a body part. Maybe it's just circumstances. Y'all remember when you had that little baby and he was so pretty and then he turned into one of them? <laughs> and you got stretched. Yeah. Well, that's life. And someday there'll be no mourning, crying, death, nor pain. But right now there are things that happen that uh, we can't completely control. And that was David and these men. 
Well, in verse 14, he went through the tribes of Israel to Abel to Beth Mekah. And all the Beerites, a, beer, a fellow from Beerite, that's not a fraternity. I know you're thinking the Beerites are a fraternity in Israel. Now, they are of a certain city in Benjamin. The only guys he can get are his homeboys. You know, it's interesting that Israel separated from David to go after Sheba. But they found out that after they rejected David, nobody wanted to follow him. Quite often, it's easier to have a declaration of independence than it is a reform. So they knew they didn't want David, but they didn't know who to put in his place. The word Sheba in Hebrew is from a word that means to splinter, to shatter, to alienate, to separate, to destroy. And so they left God's beloved, which is what David means, to take the shatterer that alienated him. As a matter of fact, Mecca means to squeeze. And this was a noble city in Israel. He goes there and all of a sudden it is assaulted by God's justice. The word Abel means vanity or barrenness. And so you've got the beloved and people are seduced by the splinterer that go to a city that is now squeezed in a place that is barren and vain. So a guy says, you know, I really do not want Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, who died upon the cross for me and will come back and rule. I don't want him. Go to your tents, O Israel. And then the question comes, well, who will you have? Who will you take? You'll take Nature, will you worship that? That's worked well. Will you take uh, hedonism and pleasure? That worked well for us in the 60s, didn't it? Will you take power, war, politicians? That's worked well for the world. Now, once you renounce David, then who will you take? And so we find that our solutions are worse than our defections. It's easier to have a 1776 than it is a 1787. It's easier to have a declaration of independence than it is to have a constitution. And so they don't know who to follow now. And not many did. Well, in verse 15, and here comes a cruel messenger. They came and besieged him in Abel, Beth Mekah, and they cast a siege ramp against the city. And it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab were wreaking destruction to topple the wall. Is that a frightening verse? In the words of the great prophet Augustus McRae? What series are we talking about? Lonesome Dove. That all Texans know about. You remember what his words were? When you ride with an outlaw, how's it go? You die with an outlaw. And so Abel, Beth Mekah, you may have been a famous city, but you have housed a rebel against God's anointed. And so you will die like an outlaw. Y'all remember a fellow named Achan in the Old Testament? God said, don't pillage the city of Jericho. He did. He took the mantle of Shinar and God called him out and he was removed. Y'all remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were called out and removed. And so any person, y'all remember the Benjamites that housed Sodomites that murdered a man's wife and they wouldn't turn them over and all the nation almost exterminated Benjamin. So whether it be a person, a couple, a city, a nation, you do not embrace a Jezebel. You do not embrace a Sheba. Because if you do, Joab is coming. And he kills well. And so this is a great lesson for us. So what, and I have seen men and women and couples that avowedly knew Jesus Christ and professed him. 
who at some point in their life essentially said, uh, I will turn from him and I will do this. And they embraced a splinterer and uh, they got squeezed and they became vain and life assaulted them and they had to come to a decision. Well, in verse 16, praise God, here's a wise woman from the city. Whenever David came, was going to destroy Nabal, who was the woman who stood up and said, think about it. Y'all remember her name? I forget. Abigail. Abigail said, David, you better think about this. You're in the heat of the moment. It's going to have repercussions. And he did. A wise woman. David would not fellowship with Absalom. And a wise woman of Tekoa came and said, you better think about this. And here, a wise woman. Whenever sin occurs in the book of Genesis, God says, here's the solution. The seed of who will crush the serpent's head? The seed of the woman. Christ rose from the dead. Mary Magdalene announced it. The angel Gabriel came to Israel. Zechariah didn't announce it. Elizabeth, it's the woman. Salvation comes by the woman. It's not by the kings. It's not by the politicians. It's not by the educators. It's not by the orators. It comes by a woman that brings birth to a child. A virgin shall be with child. Uh, this is why I think that even in pagan mythology, in the gropings of pagan societies for light, the heads of their pantheon of deities, the heads of war, are like Mars and Ares and Jupiter and Zeus. Uh, the heads of passion and lust will be the Dionysius and the Pans men. But when you come to the gods of harvest, that you'll find a Diana. To the gods of life, you'll find a Zoe. Uh, when you come to wisdom, you will find a Sophos, a Sophia. That there's something about us that knows that women are not akin to destruction. They're akin to life and nurturing and diplomacy. That's why I heard a guy say that the only solution for America would be to turn it over to the women. And you don't have to amen if you don't want to. But let them run the thing because maybe they would have more of a mothering instinct, wouldn't try to promote themselves. I don't know. But it's interesting that even with pagan mythology, that the god goddesses of wisdom will be women. And so... Often in the scripture, whenever you read the book of Proverbs, that you'll see two women. One is calling you to perversion. She's the harlot. And then one is calling you to wisdom at the gates of the city. And she is wisdom. And so often in the Bible, wisdom is pictured as a woman that you attach as your beloved sister. And so wisdom calls out to the city, the woman. Let's don't fight this. Let's try to solve it. Let's be diplomatic. Well, in verse 16, hear, hear, please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. She knows we need to find reconciliation quickly before judgment comes. Before the, the sword falls, which it will fall on us. We need to find out why. And we need to find out what must I do to be saved. We need to say, as, Christ, as Paul said to Christ, who art thou, Lord, and what must I do? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What must I do? You need to repent, be baptized, wash away your sins. 
And so the wise woman calls out, let's have a mediation before judgment comes. What must I do to be saved? And in verse 17, he approached. The woman said, are you Joab? He said, I am. Joab's not real good with ladies. And so the conversation doesn't go long here. He said, listen to the words. She said, listen to the words of your maid servant. In other words, I am not in rebellion. I in no way want to be cross of you, Joab. You're like three and O in assassinations. You don't lose. And I have no wish to cross you. Is that a wise woman? I have no desire to become cross purposes with God. And so in verse 17, he said, I'm listening. Formerly they used to say, we will ask advice at Abel. And thus they ended the dispute. In other words, we've always been a wise people. We have been known throughout Israel for our wise decisions. And we want to be wise now, Joab. We want to find the will of God. I don't want to cross him. We've always sought wisdom. So you tell me what I must do. Let me ask you, is this a smart woman? Amen. Tell me now the will of God before I deal with him in justice. In verse 19, I am of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city, a mother in Israel. Would you destroy the inheritance of the Lord? Israel was told when you had to go within the land to fight a Canaanite, you asked no terms of surrender. It went down. But if you're outside the land, then you asked for terms of surrender to be peaceful. She says, we are not just outside the land. We're Jewish. You're bringing decimation on us like Canaanites. You tell me what the problem is. In verse 20, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow or destroy. Joab says, almost like a prophet of God, we do not delight in the death of men. Death is our strange work. Judgment is our odd work. That God so loved the world, he gave his son. He did not come into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so God does not delight in the death of the ungodly. He is good. And so Joab says, far be it, says it twice, far be it. I delight in saving, not destroying. In verse 21, such is not the case, but a man You've got one guy there in your midst. And he is from the hill country of Ephraim. He is not one of you. He's not one of your children, O oh wise mother. He is a usurper. He is someone who has come from the outside. He's somebody who talked his way in. He's not one of you. And his name is Sheba, son of Bichri by name. And he's lifted up his hand against David. That's your problem. You have had, have offered sanctuary to a man who has scorned the very king of the nation of God. And that is what your trouble is. And what you need to do in verse 21 is hand him over and I will depart from the city. Matthew Henry said, man may be the head, but it does not follow. He has a monopoly on brains. The woman is smart. I need to do whatever I need to do so that I can avoid and avert the, the rising smoke of judgment. And Joab says, you have embraced a rebel. You remember where Christ said, 
with this in mind. If your eye causes you to offend, what should you do? Tear it out and throw it from you. If your hand, if your foot, if you're going someplace or doing something or looking at something, he said, you need to have an aversion to evil. Achan, if you took this and rebelled against God, then we have to eliminate him. Ananias and Sapphira, if they're going to lie in the presence of God, that has to be dealt with. What are we supposed to do when we have sin in our life? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you don't embrace an alien thing in your life and think that you are going to go on uh, in the blessedness of God. All of a sudden, there is a siege ramp and there is the wreaking of havoc. God will have his child. And so that has to be gotten rid of. I remember, you got a minute? I was speaking in Lake Okaboji in Iowa, a big blue lake up there. And there was a fellow that gave, got up and he was talking. It was to the Christian Missionary Alliance. And I was in the wings. He was going to give a testimony that I was going to speak. And I listened to him. And he told about his grandfather. His grandfather was a great song leader within the Christian Missionary Alliance. He played trumpet. And he would lead them in singing. And then he would play his trumpet. And he had passed away a few years earlier. And he said, when my grandfather passed away, the sheriff of our city called me and he said, you need to get over here. I got over there to his house and there we found in the basement the largest collection of illicit pornographic material that you could ever imagine. And he said, this wasn't just stuff bought over the counter at 7-Eleven. He said, this was illegal stuff. And he said, my father was the postmaster in our city. He had to sneak it by in some way, my father. And he said what was frightening was that any one of those magazines could have, and this was back in the 80s that I was there. He said any one of those magazines could have indicted him and made him lose any, everything. But he said he couldn't part with them. They were precious to him. It was like Gollum's ring, and it destroyed him. And he said... He died, and even till the day he died, he knew that that would be found down there. And he couldn't do it away. That is what's called an addiction. And he passed away, and sure enough, we got to clearing out, and there where no one else could find it, we found it. And he said, I, the first thing that came to my mind was how my grandfather at times would lead singing, and he would come to the point in the hymn Come thou fount that would go prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And he said whenever he would play that, he said I would watch at that point the tears come down his face because it was tearing him apart. It besieged him. It assaulted him. It took the joy from him. And I could give you story after story. We don't want a shatterer in the life of God's children. Remember in the book of Revelation, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught the sons of Israel immorality. You remove it, or I will remove your lampstand. It's true for churches, for nations. Sin is a reproach to any people. Nations of idolatry become Nova specials on archaeological digs. And so God is holy. Amen? And if you've got this rebel that says, what have we to do with you, O David? 
to your tents, O Israel. Beware. He is not a good leader. And Joab comes on his heels. God will not give up his children. And so take that head and throw it far from you. Don't just keep him there. Don't just put him in jail, but throw it. In verse 22, then the woman wisely came, amen, to all the people. And now wisdom has to convince her generation. This is why we're having a problem. We have a rebel, a rebel against the Christ, and we've got to deal with it. Our problem is not our wall. Our problem is not our military. It's not our economy. We have raised our fist against God's anointed, and he who sits in the heavens laughs and scorns in derision. And in verse 22, they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and they threw it to Joab. He blew the trumpet immediately. We are at peace because evil has been dealt with. Does this have an application? It does. It has it in a theological sense. See if this sounds familiar. Uh, there is a glorious king named the beloved, the man after God's own heart that lays down his life for his people who stands at the river until the rebellious receive him back in and there is peace through the shedding of blood. Our King David, Jesus. And then there comes a rebel, Sheba. And he says, turn against him. And then there is failure because you find out that he is not a good leader. And now you're fighting a defensive battle trying not to drown. And he takes what used to be a mother in Israel and corrupts it and brings it to the ground. And then Joab comes and there is a decision. I will either have a head as a trophy or I will have a smoking ruin. One of the two. And then wise woman calls, wisdom calls. Don't go through this. Deal with your sin. And then he responds back. I have no desire to destroy this, but I will not go on with this thing, this dead skunk in the wall. We will deal with it. And there is repentance and the, there is atonement. There is a grisly death of the head of evil. We had one that his head has thorns in it and above that head is the name Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it was thrown outside the wall. He died outside the city gate, outside the camp, seen as unclean by the nation. And upon that death, there is now the trumpet blown that there is peace. And so it is with man. So it is with the individual. One of the first dates I ever had with Teresa is we went to a particular church and I gave my testimony and I said, well, this is a church. Obviously, they will stand up and cheer me. And she and I went and this was in 1973. Who was not born in 1973? Numbers are. And so we went and spoke and I started sharing my testimony with this college department of seven. I thought, you know, it seems kind of strange in the city of Denton you'd have a college department of seven. Somebody wasn't really attractive within this school. And I'm speaking and all of a sudden this girl chirps up and she says, wait a minute. What? You keep quoting the Bible. Yeah, because we're in a church. She said, what makes you think that we believe it? Well, I had never seen one of these genus species right here of a Christian that was liberated from the Bible, hence a liberal, theological liberal. And I looked at all of her flaccid, pale male pals that were sitting around her. And I said, you don't hold to the Bible? I said, where do you get your whole notion of Jesus? And one of her anemic young male friends <laughs> said, we think there is too much emphasis put on Jesus. 
Now, I didn't know much, but I knew this much, that the totality of who God is is made known through his son. Amen. I was brilliant. And I said, the totality of how you approach him is through his death. And there's no other way. And so to renounce Christ, and I shared that as best I knew. I hadn't been a Christian over a year. I said, when you turn from Christ, you don't turn to an alternative way. You have renounced the totality of God. I said, that's why on this church, on the very highest pinnacle, you will find a cross. I left and went outside and couldn't find a cross nowhere. All right. But I thought there had to be one. I was wrong. But I said, you renounce the totality of God. And so I just said, I got nothing to say to y'all. But you need to be careful who you are holding at arm's length from you. This is the person of the Son of God. And you have taken on heaven itself. And we left the place. That was my first inkling that the people of God can renounce his son. You want nothing to do with that. Pray with me. Father, this is a sobering text and it ends in a very grisly execution. You see a beheaded man who is cast far from a city that it might not become a smoking ruin there are lessons to be learned that are very dramatic lessons. It is a white cross on a mountain pass. Don't go this way. It is a cross on a median. Here, somebody died. And this is true for our country. This is true for Russia. This is true for a boy or a girl, this is true for a high school kid that has some smart Sheba turn him or her away from the living God and then to find out that they are fighting a defensive battle for their lives with a Joab at the gate and a choice to be made and once again, wisdom arises and says, deal with this before judgment comes. Cast this rebel far from you, that we want nothing of secularism, the exaltation of man to the throne of truth. We want nothing of hedonism, the seeking of pleasure as an end in itself. We want nothing of materialism, of piling our gold and silver and goods higher and higher like some babble of old. That we want nothing of rejoicing in man's wisdom and man's power and man's righteousness. But we will have our good King David who would lay his life down before Goliath that we might be free. And so in our lives... Lord, let us respond, as Paul said, to come out from their midst and be separate. And I will welcome you and be a father to you, and you'll be sons and daughters to me. Therefore, having such promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every vestige of uncleanness, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Let nothing come into my life that... I might uh, prefer it and despise you. You will not give up what is your own, not without a fight. If there is a man or a woman that in the quiet of their home, the reality of, of uh, harshness and disrespect is lived out before their children, you will be at the gates. If there are any that are housing the sin of Achan in their tent, you will call them out. If there is a Ananias or Sapphira that is lying in the presence of God, you will call them out. If there is a Judas that you know of, you will look him in the eye 
and you will state, will you deny the Son of Man with a kiss? And so you will not share your own. And we will ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.